This episode can be watched as a standalone, though it does build upon ideas presented in the previous video, so there is a link to that in the description. In Bran 4, A Game of Thrones, Old Nan says, In that darkness, the others came for the first time. They were cold things, dead things, that hated iron and fire and the touch of the sun, and every creature with hot blood in its veins. They swept over whole fasts and cities and kingdoms, felled heroes and armies by the score, riding their pale dead horses and leading hosts of the slain. All the swords of men could not stay their advance, and even maidens and suckling babes found no pity in them. They hunted the maids through frozen forests and fed their dead servants on the flesh of human children. In addition to being objectively terrifying, this passage gives us a few clues. First, between Iron and the others. We learn later that the first men dominated the continent during the Westerosi Bronze Age, and only began working with Iron after the arrival of the Andals, who, in turn, had learned from the Rhoynar. Using Iron to guard against the Fae is a common trope in real-world folklore. So, assuming Iron can be used to guard against the children and the others, this means that, prior to the arrival of the Andals, the first men would have been primarily limited to using fire against the others. The book that Sam finds in Clash tells us that obsidian and dragon steel are the only deadly weapons humans can use against the others. We are also told that the children of the forest would periodically supply the Night's Watch with obsidian. But why? In the show, we see the children of the forest create the Night King using some sort of sacrificial spell. This never sat well with me. In the books, the others appear to share far more characteristics with the children of the forest than they do with humans. Or, put another way, the others and the children of the forest appear to be different races of the same species. And this idea already exists in the real world. While not universally accepted, there is a branch of fey lore that describes the Seely and Unseely courts. The Seely court was associated with summer, the Unseely court with winter. Following this train of thought, the children and the others are both long-lived supernatural beings distinct from humans and related to each other. I'm glossing over several details because they will be discussed later in the series, but logically it follows that the first men would have arrived in Westeros and encountered both the children and the others and viewed both groups as enemies. In fact, we are told explicitly about the wars between the children and the first men. How the first men burned the weirwoods and the wars only ended with the pact made on the Isle of Faces. In Brand 7, A Game of Thrones, Martin explicitly tells us twice that the first men came with bronze. He highlights the children's use of magic in breaking the arm of Dorne. While the story claims that the first men outmatched the children in terms of strength and weapons, the fighting was costly for both sides, and all the while the weirwoods were being destroyed. At surface level, it's logical to assume that the first men came to negotiate for arable land and the children came to negotiate for the preservation of the remaining weirwoods. That is what we are told. But what does this have to do with the deliveries of obsidian? Many people have identified the connection between the weirwoods, the children, and the others. The trees themselves are terrifying and unnatural. They connect people to dreams and visions, they accept human blood as sacrifice even to this day, and they have consumed countless green seers, as Bran observes in Blood Raven's Cave. David Lightbringer has done extensive work describing the parallels between the Others and the Weirwoods if you want to check those out. Most recently, House of the Dragon hinted at the connection between the Others and the Weirwoods. While practicing High Valyrian, Jace tells Rhaenyra that Aegon ordered the trees be killed. Rhaenyra corrects him and says the trees were felled. As Galitis points out, it means the same thing to the tree. While some may consider this to be a throwaway line, this exchange invites us to consider the trees as living beings and inherently connected to the threat of the others as much as they are to the children. The writers want us to connect destroying the trees with Aegon's dream about the next long night, and since we know how connected the children are to the weirwoods, this implies an inherent connection between the children and the others. In real-world folklore, one of the key differences between Seelie and Unseelie Fae are the links to which each group must obey certain rules and customs. Seely Fae are not particularly kind towards humans, but they can be helpful to those who observe tradition and offer gifts. Unseely Fae are not bound by this and will harm humans whether the humans observe tradition or not. So, assuming that the first men arrived on Westeros, 
not knowing the rules and customs of the children, they began cutting down trees and found themselves fighting a metaphysical war against both groups. Without iron weapons, their only real advantage was numbers. The children and the others would have a shared interest in protecting their land, the trees in particular. So why did the children make peace instead of fighting alongside the others? In Brand 7, A Game of Thrones, we are told that the wise of both races prevailed, and the chiefs and heroes of the first men met the green seers and wood dancers amidst the weirwood groves of a small island in the Great Lake called God's Eye. Presumably, leaders on both sides eventually realized that at least some of the enemy could be reasoned with. And here's how I think the negotiations went. Hey, stop destroying the weirwood trees. They're very important. We can't. Those other guys are really mean, and it's the only way we've been able to fight back. Okay. That's fair. Those guys are jerks for no reason sometimes. So how about this? You stop destroying the trees, start being a little more civilized, and we'll equip you to defend yourselves against our frosty cousins. That sounds good, just, you know, depending on what you mean by being a little more civilized. So how did the children equip the first men, and what rules were the first men bound to in exchange? The obvious answers are obsidian in exchange for not harming the trees, but I believe it goes deeper than this. The first men are known for strictly following customs that aren't observed by the Andals or Roinar, or at least not observed to the same extent. In particular, honoring guest right, the Lord's right of the first night, and the worship or sacrifice to the weirwoods. The first men also appear to have received the power of green sight and skin changing, abilities that, as far as we know, don't appear among the Andals or Roinar. So the negotiations may be broken down into multiple promises. Obsidian in exchange for ceasefire against the weirwoods, green sight and skin changing powers given to first men through blood sacrifice to the weirwoods, safe passage in exchange for honoring guest right, and if green seer powers were only granted to those first men who attended the meeting at the Isle of Faces, the Lord's right of the first night could be a method of promulgating those powers among a greater portion of the population, sort of like the Targaryens and the dragon seeds. This explains the maintenance of seemingly outdated customs in the north. It explains why the Andals were able to come to Westeros and destroy the Weirwoods with impunity without fighting a costly war against the Children of the Forest. The Andals arrived with iron, an advantage that might have allowed the First Men to decimate the Children if they had had it. In later videos, we will be looking into the formation of the Night's Watch, the magic of the Wall, and why there must always be a Stark in Winterfell. If you want to stay updated and help select future video topics, please subscribe here and do check out my Patreon linked in the description. My theories will never be hidden behind a paywall. There is never an expectation or obligation. The hope is simply to put theories into video form faster and with higher production quality. In return, patrons get benefits like priority placement for Q&As with more benefits added as the community grows. Let me know in the comments what you think. Until next time.